from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to the uh, final event of uh, Roseanne Cash's residency here at the Library of Congress. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here, and I'm happy to welcome you on the calm night before the storm to come here in Washington, <laughs> D.C. Um, so for the past two nights, Ms. Cash has um, performed with her band and with uh, Ron Robin of other musicians in the Coolidge Auditorium, which is just downstairs from here. But we're happy to be up here in uh, this room in a much more intimate space with all of you. Uh, to have an onstage conversation about uh, how songwriting connects to poetry. And uh, we're thrilled uh, to have Ms. Cash here with our 19th Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry at the Library of Congress, uh, Natasha Trethewey. Many of you, I'm hoping many of you, remember a night like this uh, seven years ago when Poet Laureate Ted Kuzer uh, talked with uh, singer-songwriter John Prime. Uh, tonight's conversation hopefully establishes a tradition in which our laureates speak with songwriters uh, about the power of lyric language. And there are no two better practitioners of the art uh, than uh, the two people sitting uh, to my immediate left. Um, you can read more about both uh, Roseanne Cash and Natasha Trethewey in your program, but let me just say that I think both engage with the past and the grand traditions they come from to sing us into the future. Before we begin, begin, let me also ask you to turn off your cell phones and any electronic devices you have that might uh, interfere with the event tonight. Thank you. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. Uh, in addition to being the home of the Poet Laureate, and before that, the Consultant in Poetry, uh, we have hosted readings, lectures, symposia, and celebrations of all shapes and sizes for over 75 years. To find out more about our programs, uh, you can visit our website, www.loc.gov poetry, and you can also sign up on our sign-up sheet, which is uh, in the back of this room. And there are some uh, materials about upcoming events that we have uh, in the spring. I would also like to make a shout out to the library's music division, which is hosting Miss Cash's residency. Uh, it puts on an unrivaled series of concerts throughout the year. Uh, please visit their website, www.loc.gov slash concerts, to find out more. Uh, much thanks to Sue Vita and Anne McLean uh, of the music division and to Roseanne Cash's manager, Danny Kahn, for all their work to make tonight's event possible. Uh, so, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we're going to have a, a conversation for uh, 30 or 40 minutes or so, and then we're going to open up the floor to uh, questions from you. Um, and hopefully your questions will connect the two of them as, as we will do and connect both um, songwriting and poetry. Uh, there was a question I feel like I had to ask, and I wanted to find the best way of asking this question. I, we had to sort of get through it to continue on uh, with our conversation tonight. Uh, so my first question is, both of you have fathers who are practitioners of your art. Given that, what might the two of you already know about each other, and what might you want to know? Mm, that's pretty good, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say that I was really taken with the interview that you did with Terry Gross about the list. Um, and of course, if, you, if any of you in the audience heard it, then you know that um, uh, Roseanne was talking about this list of 100 songs that her father told her she needed to know, right? To be yeah. a singer-songwriter. And I remember thinking um, that there was a similarity, but also something that was very different in the way that you were describing what your father did for you in that instance. Um, I remembered that I'd always asked my father for those kinds of things. Uh, my father was 
my first professor of creative writing when I went to graduate school. So I was in his class. Wow. <clears throat> and so I was getting, you know, that kind of thing from him in class. But what it really reminded me of was um, at that point when I was in graduate school, I knew I wanted to be a poet. My father and I were in New Orleans and we were walking down the street in the quarter and we stopped in front of a doorway because we could hear the lovely voice of a singer, you know, coming out of the doors. And I kind of listened for a moment and then said very wistfully, oh, I wish I could sing. And my father said to me, how are you going to be a poet if you can't sing? And for that moment, I was pretty devastated. I still can't sing, but I think uh, <laughs> I sort of steeled myself to figure out a way to make my poems like song. That's interesting because I strive to make my songs, the lyrics, be able to stand alone on the page without their melody. So we're doing the same thing. I think so. But, oh, well, but you could probably it. sing my poems, and I could not. Maybe I could say your songs. Well, because <laughs> you wouldn't want me to sing them. They, but I, <laughs> I don't know. My songs coming from you might sound kind of like da 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 da. You know, I you stick with your poems. But what I um, what interests me about that, and I I hadn't really thought about it in this way about what fathers give to their daughters is that there's a certain gentleness and ease in what a father gives a daughter. There's not that sense of urgency or um, kind of proprietorship that fathers have with sons to be like them. So for me anyway, what my father gave me was with complete freedom and generosity. Well, I think I also never felt pressured to do what my father yeah. does, but I, I wanted to do it too. Same and, here. and I think it is that kind of tenderness or gentleness that you're talking about. And the ways that he sort of instilled the uh, importance of poetry in me. On long trips, my father would say, if you, if you get bored, why don't you write a poem about it? So mm -hmm. it was something I was always doing. That's so smart of him. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's interesting. My father passed on a love of literature and poetry to me as well, and songs, of course. But... He liked really, um, I guess, what you would call folk art poet, poem, poets. They were very simple. There was a, poem, a poet named Will Carlton, and he wrote about rural life and a preacher who went to the Holy Land and then talked about it endlessly until he bored his congregation. You know, his poems would be about these very small pictures of rural life. And... Um, I, I used to read those poems to him in the last few years of his life. Yeah. Well, my father used to dream of being a, a, a country singer. <laughs> I mean, this he, is so funny. <laughs> I mean, there was a point I remember in his life where, you know, he you know, had a couple of glasses of wine and said, came in and said, I'm going to Nashville, honey. And this is, <laughs> you know, way after you might think of someone making that journey to Nashville to make a career. But he... Um, I think it, on one of those nights, I used to sit out on his porch in the country, and he tried to teach me to play the guitar. Um, Did he play guitar? He does, yeah. yeah. He plays the guitar, and you know, he'd be singing some lead belly song and you know, trying to teach me, um, and, I, and I could never do it. But we both wrote poems about that night. He finished his and, and, and published it. The poem of mine, Guitar Lesson, that I tried writing, has never been one that I felt was finished uh, successful enough to go out in the world, but I've been trying to write about him trying to teach me that. But in a way you did, because um, your poetry has an element of the blues in it, you know, so maybe you... It worked its way it in. It worked so. its way in, I think so. I mean, to me it does, that kind of southern, swampy, dark-edged, oh, love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm interested in talking about um, the power of tradition. Um, and one thing I realized in referencing uh, the list is what it must be like uh, for a musician to be inspired, to, a songwriter to be inspired to write her own songs as opposed to playing songs that you know and, and have been passed down and you find a way musically 
to, to uh, inhabit differently. And I wondered if there's a parallel in that for poets too, that, that, kind, of, that kind of need to think through, feel through uh, these, these uh, great songs, these great poems, and, and then also sort of juxtapose that with the poems and the songs that you write yourself. Well, it certainly provides a standard for the kind of songs you want to write. Um, and I used to write down the lyrics, like I, I would read the lyric on a page of a, what I thought was a great song, and then I would rewrite it for myself to dismantle it and figure out why it worked. Why, what made that a great song? You know, just breaking down the rhyme scheme, uh, how a pattern would repeat or an image that showed up in the first verse would then tie up the song at the end of the last verse. Why was that so powerful? And then, you know, as someone who wanted to be a songwriter to try to replicate that in my own writing and steal as quietly as I could, you know? Yeah, that was something I wanted to ask you about, so I'm glad you asked her, Rob, um, because you also talked about um, when you did inhabit those songs on the list and what it meant for you to, to sing songs that you hadn't written. And I was thinking about how I, I know that you also write fiction and that um, fiction writers um, will often give an assignment to students to actually just copy, write out um, a story in longhand that someone else has already written to sort of feel it um, in the body and in, the, you know, in your hand writing it. And I was thinking about how I, I'd never done that, but I use imitation all the time for myself and with my students. And it, it, it's exactly what you say. When you're imitating a poem line by line, I'm looking at the pattern of imagery and the syntax and, and the sejuras in the poem and, and how it does what it does. And I feel like when my students do that, because at first they're a little nervous about imitation because mm -hmm. they think it means copying and I have to assure them that it's just like form and whatever material they have to pour into the form will be different. But once they do it, they often write some of the best poems and I think some of, you know, some of the poems I've been happiest with are poems of mine that are deeply influenced yeah. by the movement, the rhetorical and syntactical structure of a poem I loved. That, I find the very same thing. And um, also, as an adjunct to that, I think it's really important to know the tradition you're writing in. If you don't know who wrote these kind of poems or who wrote these kind of songs that came before you, you know, you're at sea. It's so... Uh, I can't stand, I work with young songwriters sometimes, and I can't stand it if they're writing in a, you know, a strict folk tradition and they haven't listened to any other folk songwriters. But um, I was gonna say something else about that, about imitation and inspiration, but it'll come back. <laughs> I thought it would also be fun to talk about historic persona. Um, which is something that Natasha uses a lot in, in her poetry uh, and something that you turn to in your latest album that you're here at, in residence uh, to promote. Uh, what did that mean to you to take on these voices, uh, these historic voices? Um, and, and how might that be different singing them than, than writing them uh, in a poem? Well, I just remember what I was going to say and it answers, answers that question. Okay. <laughs> um, the, I'd always wanted to write a song in uh, the tradition of those great Appalachian and Celtic ballads, story ballads. Some of them were very long, many, many verses. And I particularly liked the war ballads, which always had a heartbreaking end. Mm -hmm. And um, I had never gotten to that. That had been something I'd been kind of reaching for for a long time. And, um, I wrote one for this last album. I co-wrote it with my husband, John Leventhal, and my ex-husband, Rodney Crowell. We actually co-wrote the song together. And it's a Civil War ballad um, based on two of my real ancestors, uh, William Cash and Mary Ann Cash. And I had ancestors who fought on both sides of the Civil War. So I left it ambiguous in the song whether he was Confederate or Union. And um, then the, the couple became a metaphor for the union, their union, 
the union of the country. And it was an incredibly satisfying experience because one, it was a third person narrative, which I wanted to write and in that tradition, that ballad tradition. And I co-wrote with both my husbands, so that. <laughs> Hopefully they didn't echo the Civil War in any way. <laughs> That would be too much content, student <laughs> content. <laughs> but uh, songs seem to be so much a part of um, the culture of, of, of the country. And when, when you think about uh, soldiers sitting by the campfire singing songs to one another, maybe songs have a different kind of frame of reference um, pointing to the past. I don't know. I'm curious. To the past, um, to how we, to how we, how we express ourselves, how people express ourselves, how people express themselves, how how um, uh, we think through poetry, we as a culture engage through poetry and engage through song. Well, it sounds like you're talking a little bit about um, well the role of the ballad, um, yeah, which is you know what Roseanne was just talking about that they help us to record the cultural memory of a people. Um, those stories that are uh, illustrative of the particular historical moment and the values that the people had um, uh, during that time. So they, they do help us sort of know something about the past. Let me ask it in a simple yes or no way. Do you think that, do you think that whether or not it's a sung ballad or it's a persona poem, you know, a sequence of sonnets, it matters? Does that, does that shift in form matter? Do they do something different for us? Well, um, I suppose in both cases you want something of, to be memorable and rhyme uh, or the, the musicality of song is what helps us to remember things and to make that story memorable. So I don't know, um, if that's what accounts for uh, a particular difference, whether it's the ballad or the persona poem, because I also think it's about voice as well, um, that hearing the intimacy of a voice is also what helps us connect to a particular time and place. And let's not, not forget, I mean, we're kind of talking about the lyric quality, but you know, a lot of songs require a backbeat, you know. If you read the Rolling Stones, Give Me Shelter on the page, it's kind of cool, but you got to have that driving yeah, backbeat or else yeah. it's not Give Me Shelter anymore. What's it like to, to read your, read your, <laughs> we all love Give Me Shelter, but uh, uh, what, what's just it like to read your, <laughs> yeah, I guess if you said just a shot away, it doesn't really work the same way. Right. Uh, but you read, you read your song lyrics to yourself, right? And oh, sure. And, and, and do you think You mean about when I'm editing or as I write? Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. And at what point do you start actually singing them? Uh, well, no, that's an interest. That's the question I think you're saying is which comes first, music or lyrics? And the answer is both because it comes in all different ways. Sometimes I have a complete lyric uh, or a partial lyric that it doesn't have a melody and the melody comes later. Sometimes I'm co-writing and somebody else is writing the music. Sometimes I have a, a melody with nothing to it and I go through reams of lyric ideas to get something or something sparks. You know, I mean, it, you know, it happens a million different ways. That's right. If, it, if you knew how it was going to happen, if it was predictable, it wouldn't be poetry and songwriting anymore. It would be something else. Natasha, do you, do you uh, listen to yourself read poems? Do you ever record yourself reading poems? Or, and do you always read the poems at, at some point in the process as you're writing them? Oh, uh, the whole time that I'm writing them. Um, I, I don't think I could write them without hearing them and, and feeling them, you know. But I'm tapping my feet as I write them um, and, and hearing and feeling the music in that way. But of course, it, it's, it's different, you know. I'm thinking about how um, The, the struggle, I think, of, of trying to create a kind of musicality in poems. I mean, this is something that you and I have talked about. Um, Rob and I have talked about this, and I'll just confess it. Uh, this feels very much like a confession. <laughs> but I, I feel like because I 
I grew up loving the rhythm of syntax. I love sentences, and, and I, um, I, I hear the rhythm of syntax, and yet sometimes you can read a poem, a, a particular poet, and be so focused on um, perhaps content or the, the way that imagery is used that the, the musicality might wash over you in such a way that you don't take notice of it. You know, um, well, I think T.S. Eliot talked about that. Um, just that, you know, some, some poems, um, we uh, attend to the sense and let the sound wash over us. And in others, we attend to the sound, the sonic qualities, and let the sense wash over us. And I think maybe because I'm not musically inclined, it, you know, in some ways, um, like I couldn't sing when I heard that woman singing in New Orleans, I, I'm always drawn to attending to the sense, but feel the music when it's there. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm very attentive with that with my own work. So it's always surprising to me if I, you know, allow myself uh, a moment of reading a, a critic who doesn't realize how musical my poems are. <laughs> there I said it. <laughs> and I think it's because maybe they're just attending to the sense, uh, you know, the content. And I think your poems are incredibly musical. I would say you're a great musician. <laughs> That's interesting, too, because in your book, in Composed, uh, it seems like uh, you use poets and poetry. When, when someone's doing something you know, greatly, uh, as a songwriter, you talk about them being a poet, or you want to get into the poetry uh, of, of, of a song in the process. Do you think the same way, too? We, to, call, to, call, to say to Natasha that, that you think of her as a musician is a way to sort of celebrate um, um, something something uh, be, you know, that we might not turn to poetry to, to, to um, hear, but is always there. Oh, God, yeah, the, the rhythm and the, uh, that, the melodic lyricism of her poetry and uh, any great writer. You know, I mean, Tolstoy was musical in the way he wrote. There's, in great prose, there's always a melody, mm -hmm. always. And sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes it's jarring. I mean, you know, um, I mean, when I write prose, that's the, because I'm a songwriter and I feel a little more awkward writing prose, the first thing I try to do is find where the melody is, you know? And I like syntax, too, and mm -hmm. I like grammar. I like punctuation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Me, too. You What's know? your favorite punctuation? <laughs> Some kind of diacritic, probably. <laughs> An umlaut. <laughs> All right. Um, but when you say, when you say, for instance, he is a poet of the dirt, a, about a songwriter. What are you saying? What are you? What are you? What are you tapping into? If if if, if calling a poet a musician is tapping into the kind of melodic structure, when you're saying a, a songwriter is a poet, what are you tapping into? Um, I think Bruce Springsteen is one of the greatest American living songwriters. And if you look at his songs, like, for instance, look at his album, Nebraska, the landscapes he paints and the characters he draws are as vivid as any John Ford movie. And the fact that he does that, that you could read the lyrics and feel just as moved as you do when you hear his voice and the melodies, you know, that's very hard to do. And um, the best songwriters do that, you know? Or Steve Earle, a song like Jerusalem, which I think is a, one of the greatest. <laughs> Steve Earle fan. Yeah, I've, I've worked with him several times. But um, to so simply, without proselytizing, write this anti war song that just is about the details, the guns, and the you know, the man on the TV, what he's saying, and how he tries not to believe what the man on the TV is saying, making it so personal, yet so universal, and doing it by those artifacts, the real tangible details. You know, um, have you, you must have, have you ever um, been willing to teach songwriting workshops? I do, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, 
I did workshops and I've been guest teaching at NYU yeah. of a songwriting program. Well, so what I want to know then is, you know, because I teach poetry writing workshops and I, I'll have students who come sometimes who, um, you know, want to be singer-songwriters and they come to the poetry workshop because they think that it will help them write better songs. That's really smart of them. Yeah. I wish some of the people I worked with would do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, so I wanted to know what, then maybe that's what you would say to them. I, I was going to ask you about what you might say to them because obviously there's still this, um, as you pointed out before, there are some lyrics that are really good, but it's not the same without the melody. Without the melody. Yeah, without, it is yeah, a the, song. Yeah, I mean, and so they had there. There's something a little. I mean, I'm sure that there's plenty of songs that that cross over that are both poetry. Yeah. Without, and if you don't need to hear their music, and then you hear their music, and then it's a whole other elevation of what's there. But what do you say? Are you able to work with people who? Um, where you could see that the lyrics with whatever music might be really good, but you want it to be even better as poetry. I, I just think it's cheating to just just make a lyric in service of a, yeah. you know, a, a loop of some kind, a, you know, just the, uh, the melody of, I mean, by definition, a song has both, mm -hmm. right? And one, I have a friend who says sometimes one line is the life support for the whole song, <laughs> you know, and so you have to just start with that one line. And, I had a, a mentor who used to say, you have to throw out the best line in your song if it doesn't serve the whole song. Take that line and start something else, but you know, be ruthless. Be yeah. ruthless in your editing. Um, so about being married to melody, I think you have to have contrast. Like a song that is very bordering on sentimental and that is about you know, deep feelings, if you put that with a really sentimental melody, it's just going to collapse in on itself. So that might be served by something that was more driving and jarring, and vice versa. I mean, that's oversimplification, but, you know, that's part of how I work with them. That um, thing about throwing away the line, too, I mean, that was a lesson to learn and, and to be willing to... to you know, because sometimes you have a line and you think this is the whole poem, this is the whole reason I wrote yeah. the poem. Yeah. And then at some point it doesn't belong in the poem <laughs> yeah. anymore and it's so hard to take it out. I know. Yeah. But you know you've reached a new place in your writing life when you can take it yeah. out yeah. and put it away for later. The danger is being so <laughs> proud of yourself yeah. that you, you're leaving that line in. I don't care. Yeah. I told a student of mine just the other day who was feeling reluctant about revising a poem that one of the things that happens when you start writing a poem and you have a draft of it, you you get the music of it, even if it's not great yet, in your head. And then changing it seems like you're destroying this necessary mm -hmm. music. So it's hard to, to force yourself to change that music um, for better music. Yeah, that's the hard work of it, right? Yeah, that's the fun work. You know, I find one thing in working with um, other, I mean, you can't teach songwriting, it's, you, but I can work with them and talk with them about their songs. But um, one thing I think songwriters want to do when they're starting out is to write about themes, to write about love and forgiveness and loss and going, but yeah, but what happened, yeah, right. you know? <laughs> Did they throw a glass against the wall? Or did the, was it raining, you know? Were you sweeping the floor? What happened? The concrete versus the abstract. Yeah. Yeah. I hear myself saying yeah. it every day. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, is there something about those students that come into your class wanting to be songwriters that seems different than the other, than the other students who are there? Do you notice something, a different kind of sensibility? Well, I think it was really what Roseanne just said, the, the themes. I mean, and certainly students who come in just wanting to write poetry um, also at times begin with those big abstractions. Um, but I, I do see that, I think, with... But I think, you know, um, the, the, you know as Roseanne said, they're, they're smart for, for trying to focus on language. Um, it's fascinating to me how the similarities here, you know. It's 
It's so interesting. I imagine that, uh, you know, E.L. Doctorow would be saying the same thing, right. so his writing novels. Well, I've, we asked uh, uh, both uh, Natasha and Roseanne to give us examples, uh, Roseanne to give an example of a poem she'd like to read, and Natasha of a song that she'd like to discuss uh, for its songwriting. Uh, so who'd like to go first? Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have, well, Natasha, why don't you talk about the song that you, that you selected and why, and then we'll play it for you. Oh, you are going to play it? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, but, 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 or maybe you just want to play it first and then discuss it, however you'd like to go. Um, yeah, let's just play it. That sounds good. Well, should you tell people the name of the song? I don't even no? want to tell them okay. the name of it. We're going to listen to the it's song and then we'll discuss. So good. All right. <laughs> So, um, so you want to say you that, want to say something about that? Song, well, it, it illustrates exactly what we've been talking about because, you know, the the poem is focusing on concrete images um, to talk about this larger theme. I mean, the themes that we hear have to do with you know the economics in this town that's been devastated because the the, the coal yard isn't operational anymore and there's no reason for this train to come through anymore and the workers who would have been drawing their pay in the coal yard aren't getting paid anymore and the coal cars are standing on empty I mean it, it does all those things to tell us about that theme but it gives us the most concrete details to do it and I love each of those stanzas that that she sings um, and that was June Carter Cash, right? June yeah, Carter Cash. <laughs> that's, the, that's the version that I, I love, uh, which is different than the one that you printed out from the from the yeah. writer. And yeah. I, and I love some of the changes that that she makes when she sings it, um, particularly in that last stanza about the dreaming of going down to the coal yard. But I, I think, as much as I loved every single one of those, when I heard um, and saw the vivid imagery of, I used to think my daddy was a black man. I mean, so this guy who was employed, he was working, and he came out of the mines with a black face. Um, and that meant they could go downtown and he had script, you know, he had that money and he could buy stuff in the company store. But now he's a white man because there's no more coal and his face is white as February snow. That was the most powerful way of saying to me about the loss of those jobs and that way of living um, for the people in that song. That's what I try to tell my students to do. Yeah. What happened? Mm -hmm. You know, you brought up something really interesting with, uh, about changes mm -hmm. over time, the changes they make to these old songs and yeah. ballads. It's so fascinating to me because a lot of those uh, songs came from Elizabethan ballads mm -hmm. and then came through the Appalachians and uh, how the songs changed over time because they were part of oral history until A.P. Carter went through the mountains and started collecting them, writing them down. But there was a Carter family song called Mary Golden Tree that Aaron Copeland reappropriated. And I listened to both of those back and forth, like how he changed it. And of course, most people who listen to Copeland would not know that the Carter family first sang that song and that he took from that. It's so interesting to me. Well, you know, and one of the changes, I, I just noticed it um, when we printed this out before coming, and I just seem to, to mention it as a, um, so what here reads, um, well, there's some things that are left out of this, um, but it's that last stanza, that, and it reads here, last night I dreamed I went down, I went down to the office to get my payday like I've done before. But June Carter Cash sings, last night I dreamed I went down to the coal yard to draw my pay as I had done before. That is so much better. <laughs> coal yard versus office. Yeah. Even just sonically for me, yeah. I like mm -hmm. the sound of coal yard better than office. Yeah. More evocative. Yeah, most definitely. Roseanne, if you sing it, if you do a cover of a song, you change a few words, do you ever uh, secretly or not so secretly think to yourself, this is, the, this is a better thing that I did? No, I don't change people's <laughs> words. No, never change no, their words? No, no. That's, 
Um, I have a great story about that. I was performing at um, the Nobel Peace Prize concert, not to drop Peace Prizes. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of artists on the bill. And um, the final song was John Lennon's Imagine. And a very famous rock star, I had one verse and this very famous rock star had another. And I had the verse that said, imagine no religion. And he came up to me and he said, could you change that? Because you know my wife's family are very religious and it's going to offend them if you change that line. I said, you want me to change John Lennon's line? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I mean, it's no big deal. You know, just change it. And so we went back and forth for 20 minutes. I said, I can't change John Lennon's line. I just can't. You know, I'm physically incapable of doing that. So <laughs> the way we resolved it is that we switched verses so that he could change the line, and I would pretend not to notice, <laughs> and I would sing the other verse. Did he get in any trouble for changing the line? No. I, you know, most people don't care about that, I guess. I care. You know, uh, that's like, um, I, I feel the same way. I don't, I don't want to change um, when I'm reading a poem out loud of someone else's. Um, if I've never heard the person read it, all I have is the musical notation that is the lineation. Uh -huh. All I have is their line breaks, their use of the field of the page, and so... I try to read, you know, as close to what is given me as possible. Um, it's very hard with the internet now because they do arbitrary line breaks. Well, that's they what do I was that in say. songs as well. It drives me crazy. When I've seen it, you know, and of course it's when it's a poem of mine. When all of a sudden the line breaks are different, or the stanzas, or if I had a step down second line and it's all flush left, yeah. it's not the poem. It's not the poem. I agree. I know. Well, speaking of poems, would you, would oh, you like to read yours? I am yours? so nervous about reading this poem out loud in front of you. <laughs> and see, it's not fair, because I didn't have to say yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's totally not fair. Oh, okay. You can do it. Um, you can do it. All right. It, this is a poem by Philip Larkin. It's one of my favorite poems. It's called An Arendelle Tomb. Side by side, their faces blurred. The Earl and Countess lie in stone. Their proper habits vaguely shown as jointed armor, stiffened pleat, and that faint hint of the absurd, the little dogs under their feet. Such plainness of the pre-baroque hardly involves the eye until it meets his left-hand gauntlet, still clasped empty in the other, and one sees with a sharp, tender shock his hand withdrawn, holding her hand. They would not think to lie so long. Such faithfulness in effigy was just a detail friends would see. A sculptor's sweet commissioned grace thrown off in helping to prolong the Latin names around the base. They would not guess how early in their supine stationary voyage the air would change to soundless damage, turn the old tenantry away how soon succeeding eyes begin to look, not read. Rigidly they persisted, linked, through links and breadths of time. Snow fell, undated. Light each summer thronged the glass. A bright litter of bird calls strewed the same bone-riddled ground, and up the pass the endless altered people came washing at their identity. Now, helpless in the hollow of an unarmorial age, a trough of smoke in slow, suspended skeins, above their scrap of history, only an attitude remains. Time has transfigured them into untruth. The stone fidelity they hardly meant has come to be their final blazon, and to prove our almost instinct, almost true, what will survive of us is love. You did an amazing job. Oh, Seriously. <laughs> that was <terrific>. no, no. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I've read that poem many times, so. Well, and, and just as <coughs> Natasha, when she, when she talked to me about, about um, 
that song <coughs> focused on one particular moment. In your memoir, you focus on one particular moment in that poem. Maybe yeah. you can talk about that. Well, there's two lines in that in the poem that um, just move me so deep. I mean, the whole poem moves me, but the snow, <clears throat> snow fell undated. That sense of timelessness, like it could be any time at, at their tomb. You know, these people who once lived, who have been lying here for centuries, and the snow just keeps falling every year, you know? It could be 1520, it could be 2130. But the line that I quoted in my memoir um, was, time has transfigured them into untruth. And that's a very powerful thing to think about when your parent is famous, um, that the truth of this person has been mythologized. It's been turned into something that's partially true and partly myth. And so that's why I like that line so much. Yeah, yeah. No, and it was interesting that both of you picked poems, uh, a poem in the song that did connect to family in such a powerful way. And it's I, my stepmother singing that song, yes. which is really <laughs> weird. <laughs> and I did not choose it because of that. Right. I want you to know. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, we have a little bit of time left. Uh, I'm wondering if you all have questions. Uh, we have a couple of mics we're going to pass around. So if you don't mind just reading to the mic so we can make sure to get, the, get your question into um, as part of the recording. Check, you check. should know that by answering a question, we're, we're recording this for a webcast. So by asking a question, you're giving us permission to, to run, run, uh, run it. You, you second me first. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. We have one over here. OK. So let's go. You first. Great poem, great song. On the, on the song, the um, mandolin intro casts that dark uh, iron range kind of tension that you can cut with a knife right from the get-go. In the first couple of measures, you can pick that out as, oh, this is, this is that song from that tradition. If you had to create an instrumental intro to that poem, to cast the same kind of, here's the mood, lyrics coming. How, how would you go about doing that? Wow, that is a great <laughs> question. What's your name, sir? <laughs> My name is James, and um, I, I work here in the library. <laughs> um, wow. French horn, something sad, and uh, I guess like Barber's Adagio for strings would be too obvious, but something that's sad but kind of uh, a little off key slightly. You know how a horn, yeah, there is a sweetness. But Larkin was not sweet, you know, he was, he was kind of hardened. Um, so maybe that's something. You know how in uh, like in uh, um, Renaissance plays, like the instruments are different. They're not modern instruments, and they sound slightly out of tune. But some of them are very sweet and sad. Maybe something like that. Whatever that instrument is. Set a mood before you actually start the reading of a poem. Well, I think that, do you mean just for the, the, the individual poem in the context of a reading? Or, okay, because I do think that um, this is something I do think about, that, um, you know, when you go to a poetry reading and sometimes you'll hear the poet um, either do a little banter, you know, between poems or... Um, explain something that you want the ear to be able to pick up on. My father always used to say to me that the ear is stupid and, and that there are a few things that you might need to, to say so that um, people who are not actually reading um, can pick up on. But I think that what I like to do, and I think this may be because um, I'm sort of a grave poet in a way. Uh, I, a lot of my poems are in an elegiac mode, whether they're about family or history. 
that I'm happiest when I'm able to create a mood of that kind of reverent silence. So that that means me not talking or trying to be friendly or make jokes between the poems. And it's sometimes hard to do that because it's hard for me to go up in front of a room of people and not want to be, I want to be liked. And so that means maybe I should say something between that will do that. But sometimes it's better to just let the, the quiet um, be the thing um, instead of my own desire for you to like me. That's great. That's, that's very brave because we go up and we want to be liked. And so we end up kind of frittering away the energy sometimes. All right, thank you for uh, this evening very much. Uh, a simple question in terms of collaboration. Could you speak to how that works for you? There are, of course, great songwriting teams, Rogers and Hans, so forth, but I think of writing as a kind of initial inspiration on one person's part. So writing by committee or something, but nevertheless, obviously, great collaborations happen, and uh, you intrigue us with the familial one that you were describing. So if you could talk a little bit about that, perhaps. Well, you, you've heard of Lennon and McCartney, right? <laughs> <laughs> So collaboration does work. Um, I collaborate, I, I used to be averse to collaborating. I wanted to write everything myself. It had to be all my thoughts, my rhymes, and was very territorial about my songs. As I've gotten older, I want to collaborate more. Um, and I know it's very different from poetry, but I play, I like to play to someone's strength and have them play to mine. Like the songs on my new record, uh, 10 of the 11, I wrote the lyrics and my husband wrote the music. And then the third one, I collaborated on the lyrics on the Civil War ballad. So I don't, I think in collaboration you want to find a person where the sum is greater than the parts, you know, where there's some kind of chemistry and understanding and for instance, my husband is a great, great musician, and he hears voicings and chord changes and orchestral things that, that I don't hear. So I use him. <laughs> She's yeah, right, right there, third row. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I wanted, you mentioned chemistry, which is exactly where, I, I think it was a Krista Tippett interview um, that you did where you talked about your interest um, and discussions um, and astrophysics, if I'm not mistaken. No, theoretical physics. Theoretical <laughs> physics, yeah. excuse me. Um, and I was curious to take sort of the looking home out into sort of the, the cosmos, which is, I think, a mirror image. And it also connects to poetry um, because um, a, um, friends of mine who um, in their graduate school group in chemistry, um, there was a tradition, uh, they were led by a Nobel um, chemist, um, and there was a tradition of writing poetry. It was kind of like a competition in their group that took them beyond the chemistry that they were doing, and they were competing in poetry as well as chemistry. And so I see science kind of informing both of you, in, and I'd be interested how you perceive that feeding back into, into whatever threads of your lives, of, of your creative output. You mean looking out into the universe? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, that's why I'm interested in quantum physics because of all of the weird, well, number one, the language of it is so poetic, you know, the event horizon, the, uh, you know, all of these, I can't think of any more right now, but I read them and I go, ooh, it's still <laughs> so good for light, a particle and wave, light is particle and wave, you know. So that in itself, just the language is very inspiring, but I mean, it's, I like to be odd. I like to, you know, try to grasp what my mind is never going to be able to grasp. And um, I like touching things that feel timeless or that feel like time travel. I mean, many of the, the songs that I just wrote are about that very thing, you know, how a place 
can be part of time travel. A place exists in your past, in the past of your family, and it exists in the future for your children. And the place is the nexus of the time travel. And um, I mean, all of that, I'm not a traditionally religious person, so theoretical physics kind of has a religious aspect to it. There's just so big. And, you know, maybe if I screw up, there's a parallel life when I'm doing really well in. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it's all inspiration. Well, I liked how you, you know, you started with the words, yeah. the, the, those words that are so exciting, the language. Um, and then, you know, just as I was thinking that we couldn't be any more similar, you said you're not a very religious person. And, and I'd been thinking as you were talking about um, being drawn to the language of things, the language of science, or for me, the language of religious ceremony. Um, and, and once I, you know, I began to think about this, that I'm not a religious woman, so why am I drawn so to the language of religious ceremony? So it's not just the, the beauty of the words, but so often, um, well, not so often, but always, um, the words in their original Greek or Latin had secular meanings. And, it, it, it's, and in that way, they are about the past. They are a way to tri time travel in, in the words themselves. Um, every word is a poem because of its long history. Mm -hmm. And where you know it may take us from our usage now to all the other usages before that. Be grave. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, I have a mini challenge for you. I teach third grade, and every year in the spring, we start a poetry unit. And these are eight year olds. So they just learned ABCs a year and a half to two years ago. So you can't use words like secular, you can't use words like syncope. How do you describe what poetry is to an eight-year-old in a vocabulary that's very small? Now, you do know I wrote my first significant poems when I was in the third grade. Do you know this about me? So let me tell you, because <laughs> um, I think it's a good story. But my third grade teacher uh, taught us a lot of poetry. And I began writing poems. And I was even writing poems about um, historical figures, uh, it, particularly uh, you know, certain African American uh, heroes. I mean, I remember my odes to Martin Luther King Jr. that I wrote in the third grade. And my third grade teacher and the librarian of my school bound these poems and um, put them in the school library. So my first publication <gasps> happened then. Oh, and I think so that's got to be one of the reasons that I continue to be a poet. But I think it's easier for me to talk about it because I've witnessed a second grade teacher um, who was an amazing teacher. I visited her class, and she was teaching this second grade class a poem of mine. Um, and so I got to, to hear these students in the, third, in the second grade talk about this poem and then to make some of their own. And she talked about pictures. And, she, and I think maybe she used that word to explain image, but she talked about picture, and she talked about story, and she talked about memory, things that they remembered, and they were writing down what they remembered in as uh, vivid visual detail as possible. Now, she didn't say vivid visual detail. She probably said, you know, make a picture in your head of what that day with your grandfather was like and describe it, and they did. Thank you for a great discussion. Hi, Bob. Hi, how are you, <laughs> Maestro? Maestro. Uh, would you, both of you are very well educated people, would you comment on the value of that education uh, to your art and to your life? You're better educated than I am, Natasha. <laughs> I don't know. You had that list. No. I, <laughs> well, I, I didn't graduate from college. I, my formal education 
um, ended early. I went to, I did two years of college and then I went to acting school for a few months and then I went to Europe and made records. But um, I feel that acutely that I didn't complete my education. I think about it quite often. And I know another musician, I was on, he was on the road with me, and he also felt it very acutely. And so we would go to the bar after a show and make lists of books, you know, and we called ourselves the Autodidact Club. And, you know, then we would have book discussions and we tried to, you know, up the ante just a little bit. Um, but, you know, education, goes on, right? I feel the same way. I feel woefully undereducated. What? Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel the same way. I mean, and that you just have to keep, I mean, you, you obviously don't sound that way at all. I mean, because, you know, you keep learning. You keep deciding, you know, there's so much more I need to know. What you need to know is endless, and so you just endless. read the next step. Yeah. I think staying curious is the key to a good education, but I value formal education. I really do, very much. Okay. Um, Roseanne, what are you listening to right now? And Natasha, what are you reading right now? You first, Natasha. Uh, no, she asked you first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, okay. Um, you know, there are a lot of things, um, but some of the most significant things I feel like I've read lately were the, the work of some young poets that I've recently come across. Um, and I'll, so two of them, um, one is a, a, a young woman named uh, Tarfia Faisula, who has a book coming out from Crab Orchard called Seam um, in the spring, in March. And it's an amazing book. I haven't seen a debut like this in a long time. Um, and also uh, the work of a, a young poet from Detroit named Jamal May, um, which is also, uh, his first book just came out, a really uh, terrific book. And I just started rereading um, Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking. And then there's always like some history on the side. I'm, you know, I read, Reread Robert Penn Warren a lot, uh, especially his uh, legacy of the Civil War and segregation. Um, I've been listening to some old field recordings lately a lot. Um, there's this company called Dust to Digital, which is fantastic, and they rescue old uh, lacquered and vinyl recordings and digitize them so they won't be lost forever. Thank you, Library of Congress, for doing the very same thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I love this uh, man named Washington Phillips, so I've been listening to him a lot. And some blue stuff, Helen Wolf, um, some old gospel singers. There's this, a great song called John the Revelator. Do you know that song? Oh, so if you find one version of a song, then you want to see who else did it and hear, you know, the, the differences through the decades, how it was done differently. So I love doing that. And um, then my friends give me their records. I've been listening to uh, Billy Bragg and Joe Henry and Wesley Stace. And I think Billy Bragg just made the best record of his life. So it's called Tooth and Nail. It's wonderful. So maybe just one more question. Roseanne, in today's Washington Post was a review for a recently published autobiography of your father. In the article, the writer states that your father had to attempt 35 takes on one particular song. Have you ever had anything like that affect your creative process? <laughs> yes. Um. <laughs> I remember in particular uh, trying to get a vocal and, you know, I was, in the early days I was really insecure about singing and I had a lot of fear about singing and um, 
I was in the studio trying to get a vocal, and <clears throat> I think three days went by trying to get the same vocal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I finally left the studio for two weeks and said, I'm quitting. This is it. It's over. I'm not doing this. I'm going to be a housewife. That's it. And, you know, that stuff just happens. We, we tried the, one song on the new record. We wrote two different complete melodies for the song and tossed them before the third one. And, you know, sometimes it's arduous. I have a friend who says sometimes it's magic, sometimes it's work. So 35 takes, that's a lot. But he probably had a lot of drugs in his system. <laughs> And I say that lovingly. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, I imagine you've had the same experience with a poem where you're just working on it over and over and over and over and over again. Some of them, um, you know, mostly go into a drawer. And if I'm lucky, five years later, I'll pull yeah. it out and I can see what to do with it. And then that's when it's more magic than the work that it was at first to get me to that moment. But other ones have stayed there and I, you know, pull them out occasionally and it's just as arduous trying again and it doesn't work again and they get abandoned till the next time. Well, thank you to both of our uh, wonderful uh, guests on stage. Uh, Roseanne Cash, Natasha Trethaway. <laughs> I do believe we've started a new tradition here at the Library of Congress, but uh, hearkening back to an old tradition, there are books for sale in the back, uh, and I'm sure that our, our, um, our poet and our songwriter would love to sign, so please do pick up their books, uh, get, a, get, get bring them over to get signed, and um, come to more events at the Library of Congress. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.